So I was looking at your profile and you have this classical education. And I was wondering what that entails. Did you have to learn a lot of um, ancient languages? (laughs) Yep, that that is exactly what classics is. It's ancient Greek and Latin. Uh Um, I was primarily a Hellenist. That is, I studied Greek. I wrote my dissertation and all in, in, not in Greek, but about Greek literature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, although I then ironically taught Latin for years and years and humanities and English and all those things in high school. Uh, So that was my career. And, um, and that led me when I retired from teaching, I was, um, thinking about the Iliad, which is this big, you know, Mm -hmm. epic poem set in the Trojan War. And, you know, it's Mm -hmm. kind of this iconic piece in in world history um, and world literature. And there was this character, um, Briseis, who was the cause of all this fighting, but she has almost no voice in the poem. Mm -hmm. And there's a little detail we know, which is that she she's described as going all unwilling, as in She didn't want to leave the man who uh, had enslaved her. I mean, he killed her Mm -hmm. husband, brothers, destroyed (gasps) her city. You know, where where was there any source of affection between these two people? Like, how could that possibly be humanly real? Welcome to Story Power, a bi-monthly podcast where my guests and I chat about stories and creativity in all different styles and formats. My name is Lucinda Sage Midgordon, and my goal is to promote what Dale Carnegie stated in his famous book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. He said, instead of condemning people, let's try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. That's a lot more profitable and intriguing than criticism, and it breeds sympathy, tolerance, and kindness. To know all is to forgive all. It's my firm belief that the goal of most creative people is to try to understand themselves and others. That's what makes artwork of all kinds so compelling. But more than that, the personal stories of my guests promote understanding as well. Roger C. Shank, a cognitive scientist, said, Human beings are not ideally set up to understand logic. They are ideally set up to understand stories. It's my hope that story power will help us understand each other better by sharing the stories of my guests. So today is episode 114, and I'm talking to Judith. Starkston. And did I say that right? You did. Oh, good. And, um, and I have been reading your books, Judith, and I'm so excited to talk to you. And I want to ask you a question. Do you go by Judith or do you like to go by another name? Judith works just fine. As a uh, as an author, that's typically what I get called. Um, uh, sometimes Judy works too. I have yes. always gone by both all my life. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. My mother-in-law's name is Judith, but she goes by Judy. So that's why I'm asking. So, okay. So if I call you Judy during our conversation, that'll be fine. Uh, it's totally great. I, I cool. answered it both. Cool. So welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Now, I, when you and I hooked up on Podmatch, I started reading your books right away. I'm only about a third of the way in the third book of Kings and Griffins. And um, yes, uh, uh, how do you say her name? Deniti? Deniti, the, the Deniti? sister. Yes. Yes. She's just flown off again with uh, uh, Balthar. Oh. Uh-huh. Yeah, with Balthar to help uh, the Cubs who are blind. And um, Tesha has just had her uh, dream encounter with Ishana again. So I was looking at your profile and you have this classical education. And I was wondering what that entails. Did you have to learn a lot of 
um, ancient languages. <laughs> yep, that that is exactly what classics is. It's ancient Greek and Latin. Uh -huh. um, I was primarily a Hellenist. That is, I studied right. Greek and wrote my dissertation and all in in not in Greek, but about Greek literature mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and. Um, Although I then ironically taught Latin for years and years and humanities and English and all those things in high right. school. Yes. Uh, so that was my career. And um, and that led me, when I retired from teaching, <clears throat> I was um, thinking about the Iliad, which is this big, you know, mm -hmm. epic poem set in the Trojan War. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of this iconic piece in in world history um, and world literature. And there was this character, um, Briseis, who was the cause of all this fighting, but she has almost no voice in the poem. Mm -hmm. And there's one little detail we know, which is that she she's described as going all unwilling, as in she didn't want to leave the man who uh, had enslaved her. I mean, he killed her mm -hmm. husband brothers destroyed the <gasps> city you know where where was there any source of affection between these two people like how could that possibly be humanly real yeah. and I sort of was going to take the tradition at its face you know that's how she's described what is the answer to that and I ended up writing a novel set in the Trojan War about her um, as my first novel and mm -hmm. Part of that question was, all right, who were the Trojans? Like, what's this material? When you write a novel, unlike when you teach a, mm -hmm. a book or something, mm -hmm. you actually have to dress people and put them in buildings and right. they eat food and it smells and, you right. know, the, it, all the sensory things have to come fully into play. Right. And uh, so I and I thought, oh, I know all this. But no, of course, when you actually get to the page it's so much harder yes life than than you ever I mean certainly than I anticipated mm -hmm. and it was a lot of fun to delve mm -hmm. into this world and it turned out that in the many many years since I'd been a grad student there'd been just a, a, a huge amount of archaeology mm -hmm. and exploration of what is today Turkey but was you know back in the 13th century BCE right um, the Hittites. And I found out lots and lots about this culture and fell mm -hmm. in love with the world of that. It, it, it the yeah. sort of mixture of magic. And I mean, these are people who really believed in magic as a real thing, right. um, they their lives by it. So it just became a really fun source. Oh, of yes. World now is Baseus the, uh, is that Helen? No. Helen is the uh, supposedly extremely beautiful woman that Paris, Paris Alexandros, whichever name you want to call him, goes off, takes, she has un inconveniently uh, for the goddess who promises the most beautiful woman in the world to Paris. She's married. Uh, so right. when he steals her, everyone comes to fight at Troy to get her back. Right. That's the mythological explanation for the war. No, Briseis is... Um, a young woman who was living in a city very close to Troy, was an allied uh, city to Troy. Uh -huh. And when the Greeks landed at Troy, uh -huh. um, and there's probably a historical event behind this, not as it's exactly described in Homer, but there were there were conflicts and uh, and and situations that founded that are underneath the mm -hmm. tradition. and they had to feed themselves of course armies feed themselves and how do they do that mm -hmm. they go you know pillage everything around and her city was one of these pillaged oh. cities and one of the prizes they took and they literally referred to them as prizes were the women of the cities right. they would kill the men but they would take the women and she's one of those so i would that novel is exploring you know, the the concept of women as prizes or chattel or, you know, mm -hmm. like war, war uh, things, how they find, how she found a voice within that uh, and a place um, and what it was about the mythological character of Achilles, whom 
she falls in love with and who falls in love with her, what could make that work despite the unfortunate circumstances of their meeting, shall we mm-hmm. say, mm-hmm. in the middle of a war as, as opponents? Yes. So. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I am an unabashed feminist and always really angered me that, uh, the Trojan war happened because of Helen of Troy. It was like, um, okay. She was kidnapped for one thing and maybe she didn't want to go. And yeah, uh, well, (laughs) it's just an excuse to have a war. You guys. Right. There, there were clearly, um, and and most of the time, even in the ancient world, uh, there. Were, I mean, even Homer's presentation of the the head guy Agamemnon, mm-hmm. whose brother was married to Helen, it's clear financially. If this is what they're they're after, you know, the riches in Troy, and mm-hmm. Troy was very strategically placed. They blocked all the trade mm-hmm. between the, mm-hmm. you know, one side of the world of right. Of, of wealth and the other and uh-huh. you had to pay to get through the straits um uh-huh. and you frequently got stuck in troy because the winds weren't blowing the right way and you had to pay a lot of money while your ship you know I docked there mm. right so there were lots of finance you know most mostly history is driven by money like right. money and power because those are sort of synonymous in some ways um so yes, and whether Helen was willingly going or or kidnapped is kind of irrelevant to that issue, but it's an interesting. That's that's she's a character, she's the character that mostly gets written about. And mm-hmm. I was interested in a much less um prominent character yeah. because I thought her, her narrative was much more intriguing. Um yeah. There's now been since I wrote that I that book was published in 2014. So it, it's been out for quite a while, long mm-hmm. time. And there have been this whole renaissance of books set in the Trojan War. Mm-hmm. Really wonderful books. And all of us have a different understanding of Briseis. Mm-hmm. Um, some feature her as I do, and some she's kind of a more side character, but um, I mean, Natalie Haynes is a thousand ships and Madeline Miller's Song of Achilles. They're mm-hmm. all these different ways right. of looking at a mythic tradition and that's great i mean i love all of that i do too i yeah. do too yeah because um i have always i mean i was raised analyzing movies and i got a theater two theater degrees and i taught a class called dramatic structure that i absolutely loved and i've always wanted to write a memoir about the movies and the stories books too that really affected me and helped me change my life and so the other day I was thinking about that and I was thinking oh wow there's this whole section of stories about women like Medea who get uh you know they do they give their all and then they get betrayed you know? right <laughs> and have you read? There is a a very interesting. I reviewed it for historical novels review, um, a book called Medea, um, and the premise of it. I, Alish, mm, I, I have. I think I have it on my list because I just went and got. Yeah. I said I've got her read- solution. To me, that's the hardest character to mm-hmm. redeem. I mean, when you kill your children, yeah, that is to me, unforgivable. Like there's no scenario in which that's okay ever. Like, right. Right. Sorry. Not uh, okay. Yeah. And then you look at like, um, you know, the, um, uh, why am I totally a uh, Tony Morrison, Tony Morrison oh presents a character who is a mother who kills her children. And we, and we understand it in that mm-hmm. context. And then J, you know, um, Jemison, um, NK Jemison again mm-hmm. uses that same premise. Her solution in Medea, um, in this recent one, it works in some way. I think it's a really worthwhile novel. I really liked it. Mm-hmm. I'm not entirely sure that I that I was willing to forgive the act. Medea, she gives yeah. a really good cover though. It's a very elaborate way. And I, I, it would be a terrible spoiler to give it away, but, but um, 
she it's a very elaborate way of of justifying that act right and it's a very engaging one yeah i did put it on my list because i went and got the play again because i read it when i was in i think i read it when i was in undergraduate school uh but i can't remember but i remember feeling that exact same way it's like oh medea what are you doing why did right, you do right. that but you know since I've matured, it's like, Jason, you idiot, you terrible person, because he takes everything that she has given. She's given up her family, her home, her, you know, everything for him. Yeah. And then, oh, oh, I want to marry this other person over here because I'm going to get more wealth and power and whatever. Right. right. So, you know, so I was, as I was thinking about it last this last week, uh, I thought, you know, maybe that was the only way she could get his get revenge or get. Yeah, and maybe you don't need to get revenge, but I mean, right. maybe, maybe In those maybe times the hero who's actually a jerk just is a jerk. Um, and you don't, you know, you don't take it out on your kids. That would have been my solution. Just saying. Yeah. But Really interesting. And I think Euripides, you know, in the ancient Greek play is far more sympathetic to women than mm -hmm. you would assume that milieu that he would be. And I think there is a, she is definitely presented at times in a sympathetic way in that play. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I but, had to buy the play again because it's been so many years. And I haven't read it yet because I'm working on your books. But also there are so many interesting women in uh, the Greek myths and the in the plays like Clytemnestra kills Agamemnon well yes. she has a reason he killed her daughter <laughs> yes right right and there are some really good um and I'm drawing I, I'm not the title there are some really good uh tellings of her Th this mm -hmm. whole renaissance of mythic retellings that's actually what the the kind of book I'm working on right now that the mm -hmm. now that my Tesha series is kind of rounded out we should probably return to that one but but yes. I'm actually working on a mythic retelling of another woman who uh that Achilles is kind of part of her life oh. so it's about her again it's uh -huh. focused on the woman uh -huh. and and in essence, the way um, male power and and navigating through that patriarchal male power mm -hmm. to find your own place in there and your own power in there mm -hmm. and to assert that identity. Um, it's a much earlier part pre-Trojan War um, part of the Achilles myth, but it's it's about the young woman that he comes into into. Uh, her orbit, shall we say? Oh, that's cool. Yes. Now let's talk about the series because aren't you coming out with book four soon? I am. Flights of Treason. Oh, and Flights of Treason. Flights of Treason. Yeah. It will come out May 7th. Oh. Uh, yeah. Very soon. So I can I pre order it? No, because. Um, I I don't Amazon used to the the joys of being one's own publishing house. I know. Are that, um I love Amazon and I and we all struggle with Amazon. I mean it's it's mm -hmm. always the um I blessings on them for making it possible to get books to a wide range of of audience that couldn't have done. Um Right. Right. I mean I write f historical fantasy based in the Hittite world. If right. you pick a more niche market. <laughs> I mean, my agent took this series originally out onto the market to sell. Um, you know, big publishing houses loved it and then said, huh, we don't see enough market in this for us. Mm. And those who were going to say yes, they were going, eh. And uh, I happen to be in my, what I call my year of cancer, all done um, through that. Oh, but, good. You know, it, it gives you a sense of what matters in life right. and what and what brings you joy and what you want to keep. And I just didn't, um, I, at a certain point, I just said, you know, stop trying to sell this because whoever buys it, is not going to stick with me. They're going to, mm -hmm, I've mm -hmm. seen so many of my friends 
um, I had published my first book um, traditionally. So I knew what that was like. And I'd seen so many friends get a series. And this series is based on an actual Hittite right. queen really admire like I think yeah. she's just fascinating and we know quite a lot about her past because there are these huge libraries oh. of cuneiform tablets that have been excavated and really just in the last decade or two translated so this is a world when I was in grad school we did not know about uh, yeah like, you know I mean I, that we sort of thought the Trojans were I mean it, you know how like in Star Trek People um, oh. would, I don't know what that balloon thing, I, I must have said or done something. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Every once in a while on, on, on Zoom that happens, and I'm like, hmm. Um, but, you know, like on on, on old uh, Star Trek episodes where mm. they seem to all speak the same languages and, and mm -hmm, they understand mm -hmm. each other, even though culturally they're mm. from literally different planets. Um, well, that was kind of the classical approach to the Trojans. Right. Oh, they're just the Greeks, like somehow. Right. Which no. isn't, I mean, the Hittite was a language Indo-European sort of related to Greek when I read the scholarly stuff about these tablets and all, which I can, I mean, uh -huh. I'm trained enough to, to uh -huh. access that information. Um, it's enough like ancient Greek that I can understand the discussion. Mm -hmm. I can no way translate it. Cuneiform looks like a bunch of little birds. Right. Play. It's really, it's not an alphabet system. It's a whole different thing. I do not know how to, to work in cuneiform. So, but, um, but it gets, those tablets get put into an alphabet system. That's this very elaborate transliteration uh -huh. thing they do and then translate it. And once they get them translated into um, you know, a language I understand. Uh, then the whole discussion of an interpretation, I can, I can yeah. understand and process because I know the the linguistic foundation. Of right. It. But we know all this stuff, and I didn't want to ever lose control of a character mm -hmm. like this. It's not like there were fifteen Hittite queens I could just okay, you killed right. that. Series, you're you're not publishing her, but you own the first book. You're not going to give me any, you know, right. any right to publish that. So, um, so I just went Did off on my own. Yeah. But that what that does mean is that I I uh, that I play the whole Amazon game, and right. it used to be that pre-orders were great uh, for self-published authors. They opened it up to us, and it was great, but because they would count all the sales as the your first date. Now mm -hmm. it's just like you published that day. So they count all those days. And if you don't get a lot of sales, then the am little Amazon munchkins say, Oh, you're not uh you're not a book that's selling. And so before you even publish, they have said, We don't want to pay attention to you. So it's a good way. It's unfortunately for a small market author mm -hmm. like me. It's it's just marketing move. So yeah, it will be available May seventh. I'll actually probably hit the uh, ebook publishing slightly before so that it can go through all of its little right. gyrations and approvals and all of that. But it's all loaded up and ready. I just have to hit publish. Yes. Well, I read I read the author's notes about the real people and how why you change the names and stuff, which made sense to me because I couldn't even pronounce her name. Right. Uh, <laughs> or well, and, some and of the other names. Her actual historic name, Pudu Hepa, is so it's sort of ugly. Um, my oh, agent my. Joke, somewhat jokingly said, but not really said, I will not take a book out to market with that character with that name so figure something else out and tesha happens to be the word hittite word for dream and she had mm. these the historic person what? had these extraordinary dreams all through her life oh wow. that, that she thought the goddess was guiding her she was absolutely Convinced. my read of it is that she was absolutely sincere in her belief that she mm -hmm. had a personal, you know, uh, protective goddess who was on mm -hmm. her side in the course of my series, that becomes more complex because immortals don't understand what it is. Right. Live a meaningful life because if you're immortal and you never die, right. There's a fundamental way in which your life has no meaning. Right. I mean, it's a problem. 
So yeah. that dedication of of my character to her goddess matures and gets more complex and mm. somewhat adversarial over the course of the series. Um, and then in Flights of Treason, that all kind of comes to a head and 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 I try and bring all these dis these different elements in this final series, both the historical events of her life and the um fictional mm-hmm. conflicts and, and character arcs to a, a nice satisfied close. I may return to this world, like I think Daniti, you mentioned mm-hmm. um, her sister who's blind is a character who uh people really love her and I her do. story and um and Maroc, the the I, second her I, the husband I second. like him me too. Yeah. So I, I, I like hot having too also. side books that are all yeah. these other characters. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I wanna, uh, it's nice to have a series where you know, okay, there's four books. When I get to the end, I will have a sense of completion and like I'm there, you know, like right. I knew what happened. And then uh go uh, off. Right. I yeah. Later. I, I love that you have you have this wealth of characters that you can do other things with. Yeah, uh, because I really like, is it Sam C? Uh-huh, uh-huh. I really like him too. And he's a, he's a very historic character who is so interesting because he stays loyal to to Tesha and to Hatu, Hatu even though, you know, it's his brother who is the, mm. you know, the, the conflict source. Um, but he, he doesn't, even in history, um, he stuck with. So I had to come up with a narrative that could um, could explain that kind of loyalty and love that he had mm-hmm. for, mm-hmm. for in, in essence, his adoptive parents in a way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, Tesha is so young when she meets Hatu. Is he about 30? Yes. And th- she's probably about 15. I mean, these are very hypothetical ages. Mm-hmm. We know... Um, we know kind of roughly how old they are, but not precisely. And that age difference, which feels sort of icky, um, you know, like 15 and 30 and mm-hmm. what's going on here. Um, it's, it's a, that's a fairly modern sensibility. And so right. at 15, there's no adolescence in the ancient world. The the whole, right. whole idea of teenagers is a, is a very modern construct. Um, and by the time she's 15, she's been working as a priestess. She's had all this political um, education savvy that she's learned in all the intricate politics mm-hmm. of the temple. And mm-hmm. the, the temple had a huge treasury. And so she was financially, she had a lot of uh, control of power in that mm-hmm. way. So mm-hmm. um, she's no kid. Um, right. But he has uh, a couple decades of fighting a very, uh, an insurgency war in Mm -hmm. his kingdom under his belt before he meets her. So as a military leader, before he meets her, he's already, uh, fully, you know, like he, and then he's led the, the, as he's coming in to that first book, he is returning from this huge battle that the hit, the actual historic Hittites and Egyptians had this battle of Kadesh. Mm -hmm. one of the few bits of history about the Hittites that that some people actually know about because it was such a big deal. But they and they fought this huge, I mean, the amount of manpower that they both both empires deployed. Um, and the um they both after that they they just had to not have any more fights together because they'd have killed the, you know, they destroyed each other's empires. Mm-hmm. It was like um kind of like the Cold War, you know, mm-hmm. the deterrent they they had put together armies big enough to to destroy each other and that they had to say oh not again never mm-hmm, again mm-hmm. Um, so it's interesting and she actually the historic woman is was very instrumental in creating through her reign a treaty between the two kingdoms and forcing Ramses II to go along with it so I mean that's to to frame for history that people know, like Ramses II is like the Moses guy. Mm-hmm. Well, you know? So that's how far back in time we are. And and yet here's this really powerful woman leading the, you know, one of the two most, uh, you know, 
influential, powerful empires of the world at that time Mm -hmm. um, in a marriage that was famously equal. Like Mm -hmm. her husband allowed her to have, she had her own seal. She, under Hittite law, she had these rights. It wasn't like some special thing that her husband did. Most, most female, Mm -hmm. most queens did not exercise the kind of power that she did. Mm -hmm. Um, So she was unusual, but she was all within the Hittite laws. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's just, I thought that was so intriguing. And, you know, as a fellow, you said you're a feminist, me too. Um, And I think this model of, of a woman we think of history as somehow progressing and our rights are getting more and, you know, we're getting more enlightened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just not that. I mean, here is this very, I mean, she lived in a very patriarchal world. Absolutely. But here is this very enlightened model of a marriage and, and rulership. And I just think, you know, it's, it's interesting it to be known about and how better yeah. to do that than in really fun fiction that, really? you know, you have to read, trust me, reading all those cuneiform tablets and all that is very dry and boring and hard and no one wants to do that. I did it for them so they can read my books. That's and, right. Well, history without feeling it, you know, it's been that's, <laughs> that's right. Yes, really. Yeah. Well, I recently read the book Lilith. Um, oh. Yeah. Nikki. Uh, Marmory, Marmory, I think her name is. And uh, it was published last year. And she, I don't know if you know who Lilith was, she was Adam's first wife. And uh, in the book, she has eaten of both the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. So she's immortal. And her Ashara, I think, is her goddess who created her the goddess created her. And yeah. then uh, when um, she refuses to be subservient to Adam, <laughs> he always kicks her out of the garden. And, uh, you know, before that, she started to notice, you know, I haven't seen Ashara around. Well, Yahweh tricked Bad. her. Yeah. yeah. And she was in the under, she was, she was captured and taken to the underworld. So, um, you know, Lilith is trying to restore the balance because it has come, it's starting to come around that it's more patriarchal societies, but there are still these societies like the Hittites. Um, Jezebel is one of the characters in the book. Um, And uh, um, of course, Mary Magdalene later, but they are, you know, they're trying to still have these balanced male female um societies but then it turns and uh it's so that's so interesting because that is i years ago i read the chalice and the blade by rayon eisler and she talks about all of the societies that and the archaeological finds of the little goddess figures and things Mm -hmm. of how it you know, used to be more female um, driven societies and then something happened and it got all out of balance. And so now we're, I think we're just trying to go back to the balance. Yeah. And I would not say that, um, that Hittite culture was balanced. I mean, I, I would say it's decidedly patriarchal, but there are certainly women, um, had more rights uh at they could mm-hmm. own property they could get a divorce that there were a lot of things that uh, say a victorian woman could not in any way they had no property they had no mm-hmm. no rights of divorce everything was they were they were basically chattel you know mm-hmm. like property, um mm-hmm. passed from father to to husband and um and that was not true at, in the hittite world mm-hmm. um and but it's still um, it's still very much a world run and, and controlled by men. And mm-hmm. that, um, but I, I enjoy looking at that balance and, and trying to, mm-hmm. to explore it and mm-hmm. use that as an underlying part of the plot. Yes. Because there are all these really interesting women throughout history. 
Yeah, and for the and for the Hittites, actually, the whole um, I mean, the magic that I include in my series is all based in in the Hittite beliefs. And mm -hmm. one of the most fundamental of those is that there is this basic harmony in uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. So there's an upper world of the gods. There's mm -hmm. our world, and there's a world underneath, which mm -hmm. is also a world of gods. It's the there's a sun goddess of the world below, and all of that. It's, it's entirely parallel. Mm -hmm. It's not really. It's not hell, like you know, mm -hmm. concept of it. It's got some dark, uh, dark elements to it. So it's mm -hmm. you know when you when you want to uh, get rid of something really. Uh, polluted and terrible, like a curse or something like that in this world, mm -hmm. you stuff it down through a spring into the, you know, like oh, you right. find a spring in a cave and mm -hmm. shove it down in there some way or other, mm -hmm. either by burning it or they had these big ceramic ugly pots that they would dig into the ground. Um, but that idea of harmony is throughout, it's kind of the fundamental, it is the fundamental principle mm -hmm. of the magic in the series that mm -hmm. I write because mm -hmm. it was a fundamental principle of, of Hittite um, mm -hmm. law. It, it shows up in funny. I mean, there's, there's strange rites that she would have done the actual historical pri priestess. If there was a big quarrel either within the Royal family where they might be killing each other or simply in a, you know, in a normal household where a husband and a wife, mm -hmm. or somebody, you know, a, a mother and a son, whatever are fighting to restore harmony, they like she would come and make little. Um, there were a lot of steps to a right, but one of them was that she would make these little wax tongues, and you would spit out the the angry word, you know, all the things that you had said that you really wished you hadn't, and all of those. I mean, think about this as family therapy. Pretty smart, right? Uh -huh. um, and put them on these wax tongues, and then they get burnt up, and they're gone. Mm -hmm. So. Um, there are, there's, I mean, that seems not especially magic to us, but to them, it it was, I mean, it was a, a literal process. Um, but then they also have these much scarier ideas of curses and sorcery and. Oh, really? The yeah. Thing, yeah. The only crime, um, the only crimes that there was a death penalty for, um, I mean, you, if you, try and usurp the throne, you may not get the death penalty. You probably would not get the death penalty for that, but you commit sorcery or some other mm -hmm. religious pollution. So there were certain, like if you did something to the great King that, you know, got, got pollution into hit, you know, mm -hmm. this underworldly sort of pollution onto him, uh, then off with your head. Right. Um, so um, it's, it's a useful to me as a plot, uh, thing that that accusing a character of sorcery is the one way you might get them killed right um, executed and yeah and, and the young great king i can't remember what his name is um uh, uri uri right yeah uh oh he i don't like him <laughs> because he villain. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> yes yes uh, uh he has just shown where i am in the book is he has just shown up at um what's the name of the town um oh oh Alpara. Alpara, Alpara. and uh yeah it said oh I'm gonna take my army away and it's like you're not he's a typical 15 year old boy that doesn't have his cognitive abilities quite in right place. and there's an interesting I mean there's a very conscious portrayal I mean I start out the series with a 15 year old young woman mm -hmm. Who is trying to sort out how you rule, what, you know, what what's involved in that. And then him down the road, mm -hmm. another young man, and he's doing it very differently. And mm -hmm. he's doing it in a very, as you say, testosterone sort of driven way to yeah. put it in a modern set of terms that she wouldn't have at all. But um, so, yes. Yeah. Well, models of how to be and how to control others and right. how to do it not to do it yes and i also liked because she just had the dream where um ishana is a little bit upset with her for some reason and uh she doesn't know what she did and i and that was one thing about the greek myths that i always went those capricious gods and goddesses they you know 
<laughs> they yeah. just mess things up all the time. Uh, I'm thinking of Oedipus, poor Oedipus. He got punished for something that he didn't even do. <laughs> well, he did it, but he got driven to do it by being told he would do it. You know, like, yeah. Well, it, it, set him it, up, guys. <laughs> yeah, his father set him up by saying, take him off and kill him or, you know, and right. uh, it, and the guy couldn't do it. The guy that he sent off to do it right. couldn't kill him, couldn't kill a baby. And uh, yeah, so that's how it all gets set up. And it's like, you bleep, 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 bleeps, <laughs> you yeah. know, <laughs> gods and goddesses. And so yeah. it, Ishana is sort of becoming she's like a that. Double-edged, she's a double-edged sword. Yes. There are times where she's a, a great benefit. Um, and other times where she is a huge liability yes. and she does drive a wedge between husband and wife at a certain point in the series and other things. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Well, she already did that at the beginning of this book. Um, so, but yeah. And I like that as uh, Tesha makes mistakes in her magic uh, try, you know, she has good intentions, but it doesn't turn out quite the way she hoped it would. Um, and also I'm a little worried about her now because she's used all this great magic and she's quite incapacitated. So I'm hoping that she recovers, <laughs> but she's in book four, so she must recover. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I get worried for my characters <laughs> that I'm reading about. Yeah. Uh, so I'm looking forward to book four. And um, yeah, and I'll have to go back and read the other book too, because that sounds interesting. I don't really know much. I'd never read the Iliad. I think we read the Odyssey. Yeah, Odyssey. Most kids in school read the Odyssey and not the Iliad. Yeah. I, for years and years, taught it with my... Um, I had a high school class that was actually a college class. And one of the mm -hmm. core things we read was the Iliad. So that was fun because those, those were really bright kids and they had mm -hmm. all the right kinds of questions and, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a good exploration. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had to teach, I, I had to teach English at one point. I didn't get to teach drama because somebody else wanted my job at the high school. I was teaching drama. And so I had to go to a different school and I really enjoyed that. And the, it was the freshman who read the Odyssey, but yeah. I was mostly teaching juniors, American lit. That's mostly. So uh, now I had another question. So you have studied the classics. Have you traveled to Turkey and Greece and maybe even Italy? I have traveled to all those places, um, particularly the actual archaeological sites um, of that the series is set in. Mm -hmm. So um, at the Turkey is probably the most archaeologically active part of the world right now. Mm -hmm. um, there's just a huge amount of digging going on. Yeah. Um, and it's fun because it's very, you know, it's it's very contemporary, good archaeology, you know. So I, when I'm designing a meal in my fiction, I know from like the, you know, they'll do a profile of the DNA around a hearth or in the bottom of a pot. And mm -hmm. So I know like what spices are available or what mm -hmm. foods they might have, you know, that kind of thing. So there's that kind of evidence. Um Archaeo the the um the places where my fiction are set um mm -hmm. are mostly in the eastern portion of Turkey. Oh, um, so most people up. go to like Istanbul mm -hmm. or Ephesus, which has got these tremendously gorgeous Roman ruins. And to me, the Romans uh are like positively modern because mm -hmm. I'm you know, I'm a you know, millennia before that. Mm -hmm. Um so, and the, the Hittite ruins are uh, the big capital, which is called Hattusha, is um, about an, like an hour and a half or two hours away drive from Ankara. So you go up, oh. it's a huge UNESCO World Heritage Site. Oh it's, it's, you know, there's like giant fortification. I mean, the fortification walls um, are there are these huge double casement walls with you know one wall and another wall and then in between is all this fill you know so they're just 
impenetrable. Um, there were acres and acres of capital with mm -hmm. all these temples and um, and that's been excavated well. They first started in, I think it was 1906. But um, so it's there's been a lot of excavation mm -hmm. at that particular site. Uh, there's still vastly more of it to excavate than they have. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there are much more recent sites. Um, so her Tesh's hometown, which is in my fiction, I call it um, Lawaza. It's right. The actual uh, word in the Hittite is Lawazantia. Uh -huh. And um, <clears throat> when I travel in Turkey, I travel with a um, an archaeologist, art historian friend of mine who is keeps up. She's she's, you mm -hmm. know, Turkish and she keeps up with what's going on. And um, to my surprise, um, I didn't know that we had figured that some there was a reasonably good guess that we knew where that city oh. was. So we went there. I spent a whole day. The, the director of that archaeological dig is like thrilled. It was super nice. Like, you know, opened the dig all day, walked me all around. We had this like great uh, lunch all together with all of his workers, uh, uh, you know, all the grad students and, mm -hmm. and archaeology students that are working on his dig. Um, and that was really fun because I had this very physical setting, the whole, you know, there's these springs around it. That's hot part of oh. how we identified it as the place. And uh -huh. he took us to all of those. And then when I was writing Sorcery in Alpara, the second book, uh -huh. Alpara, which is not what the city was called. Right. Um, that's a fictional name, but that actual city, we were, we were just traveling, looking at different um, archaeological sites from the Hittite period. Mm -hmm. And we were in this, we happened to go stay in this little town called Amasya in um, northern part of um, Turkey, mm -hmm. up by towards the Black Sea. And um, we were in the little museum in this little town. And we had chosen this town because it's really picturesque. It's got this river and these Ottoman period. You know, we wanted to stay in a historic inn. And, you know, it, it yeah. was just a fun place as, <clears throat> as travelers. Mm -hmm. um, but we went to the little museum there. And I'm like, wait a minute. They're saying that this town is likely the historic locate the location of the historic Hak piece which you can see why I didn't call it Hak piece these names like you know really, right like you're spitting you know right uh, <laughs> that was the town where Hatu's capital was uh -huh. and here we are in Amasya there's this mountain steep steep mountain and at the top was a like medieval fortress and they had discovered underneath the medieval fortress, they had done soundings and it, it's a Bronze Age place. And they're pretty sure that it's it's the most likely candidate for his town. So then I'm like, wait a minute, we got to go, you know, like this is now, it's a really dramatic setting because once you get up on this mountain, it's, yeah. you know, the, the ancient road must have been really an engineering feat for it and and mm -hmm. it had seven circles of mm -hmm. bronze age fortifications so you know this was a, a capital under constant attack so that makes sense but i i would never have thought of making a seven walled right city and yet here you know here it is and you can see the um so you know the 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 windows of of um Hatu's, um, private right. you know that view and all of that that's because I was standing there looking out and and have that travel induced you know yes. strength vision so it's really fun to travel that way and to get um mm -hmm. and then you know by the time this fourth book we're um going between Alpara and the capital and so having been to both is really important. Yes. Um, writing. So yeah. it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Travel is huge. It's, it's a huge privilege. I mean, it's so expensive to travel and that's mm -hmm. you know, what a luxury, but yes, my husband and I do these great trips and he takes all my photographs and has learned he can look at a bronze age ruins and say, Oh, there's Ashlar block over there. That must be the temple. Do you want me to go take a <laughs> <of them?" Yes. laughs> Off you go. <laughs>
<laughs> He's a great assistant. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Oh, I have a great assistant too. My husband is a techie and he's the one who laid out my book and did my first novel and did the cover art and, you know, all of that. So I understand that whole publishing a book yourself thing. Yeah. And, uh, it's a, it's a project. Yeah. And he's an artist too. So uh, a visual artist. So, yeah, when we went on our trip around the world, we went to lots of museums because we wanted to see the artwork, you know. Right, right. And uh, unfortunately, when we got to the Louvre, we paid for our ticket and then they went on strike. Oh, the workers went on strike. <laughs> so, well, all we could go see was the Mona Lisa or, you know, famous things like that. That was Yeah. That. So but we're going to have to go back at some point. Um, to the loop and hopefully they won't have a strike the day we go but uh we but that paris of course has a whole bunch of other museums and and we went to museums everywhere um and we even went to like we went to olympia uh but we got stuck there we were supposed to go to epidavros after that but pop and Dreyoff died and the whole country shut down and he was the prime minister during um world war ii and so we didn't get to go there. So I have to go there because, you know, the, all those Greek plays were yeah. performed there. It's very fun to see. I, I've when I was in Epidoros or Epidoros, mm-hmm. however you want to pronounce it, um, they you can they will they put on the Greek plays there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a bit like being in London and going to the reconstructed globe and seeing mm-hmm. Shakespeare. It's it's nothing like Shakespeare anywhere else. It's like you suddenly get uh-huh. the whole thing. And similarly with Greek play, seeing them there at that, yeah. that is such an impressive theater. Yeah, um, we went. Oh, uh, we did see the one in Athens. Yeah, uh, yeah. but it's that not the same. a little less. Uh, it's it, it's it's I mean, that's the real, you know, the the beginning of theater right mm-hmm, there mm-hmm. so it's um i mean i have to say that it brings tears to my eyes to just be in that space but um but it hasn't been reconstructed as a right. function of theater because it's an archaeological site you don't just go willy-nilly you right. know like oh, let's rebuild um a, a, a peter has, it has been uh reconstructed enough so that it can you know a huge audience can right. come in they can put on a play, you can see it, you know, so it's a, um, I really want to go there. Thing. Yeah. It's very cool. It's been well, and also like the that. whole, oh, I'm sorry. I, oh, I was just saying it was a lot of years ago that I did that and I should do that again. That's fun. Yes. I have no idea what they're producing there right now. Yeah. That was in 1996 when we took that trip and I just wanted to stand down on the orchestra and, you know, have Barry be up on the top and I whisper and he could hear me. <laughs> You know, I just wanted to test that out <laughs> because the acoustics is supposed to be fabulous. So yeah, they yeah. are. Yeah. But it, it was interesting because when we went to England, there were all these uh, archaeological sites that we, we took a tour and went to Stonehenge. Of course, you can't get close to Stonehenge, but we went to West Kent at Longborough and some other places and oh, well, Avebury Circle, and you can touch the stones at Avebury yeah. Circle, or you can touch the inside of the West Kent at Longborough. You can't touch anything in Greece. Couldn't touch anything. Uh, they, w- they wouldn't let us touch anything. Well, I guess when I was in college and spent, I spent a whole summer in Greece after I after my junior year, I'd done it at, at University of Edinburgh, and I was had a a Brit rail, a British student pass, so I mm-hmm. could go everywhere on a train. And uh, I, but when I've since been back to like the Acropolis and all, it is much, much, they just got flooded with tourists, so they have mm-hmm. to protect mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I have to say that as I've made my way around Cyprus and Turkey and all of these archaeological sites, I, I probably get access because I go with, like mm-hmm. the directors of the digs and that I, I'm much more upfront, you know, t- I know how not to destroy an archeological site. So I, you know, I can yeah. visit, you can't just let, you know, or yeah. come tromping through. Right. 
Well, all I did was put my hand on, you know, I was just, no, 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 no. There's no problem with that. But that is, that is in fact, you know, completely fine. That's why, you know, I can go, you know, yes. Yeah. On, on a, yeah. On, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, they would, uh, uh, that was at Olympia. Uh, I put my hand on something and somebody came along and said, no, 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 you can't touch that. I was <laughs> like, oh. Oh, well, you know, if you get a million hands touching something, it changes the, you that's know, true. The, yeah. 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 What's, what's harmless in one hand becomes harmful. I mean, preserving yes. the past is, is a, yes. a delicate thing. Yes. Um, yeah. And so, but just being in those places. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You know, and uh, places like, did, did you go to Delphi? I mean, when they talk yes. about it being the belly button of the world. There you are. And you feel yep. like, you know, you're, you, yep. you totally get how that became the sort of mythic yes. center of the world for the Greeks, because it looks like the mythic center. It of does. It feels like that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we did go there and uh, we didn't get to spend as much time as I wanted. So we'll have to go. I, I want to go back to Greece though, because I, I loved it. We spent three weeks there. We went up to Thessaloniki uh, we spent a week on the uh, peninsula of Cassandra at Afitos and uh, just, you know, put our feet in the Aegean Sea and, you know, uh, ate, went to, went to the market every day. And we had a little hotel room that had a little kitchen. So we'd go to the market every day and get the food that we were going to eat that day. And it yeah. was just so fun. I loved it. I loved it. But I didn't get to go to all the places that I wanted to go. Oh, wow. This has been so much fun. Um, after you write, uh, after your fourth book is published, you're working on another book. Now tell about that again. Well, that is part is a, what I call a mythic retelling. So it's a, my, the sort of kernel of the plot comes from an early myth in the Achilles story. Mm -hmm. um, it's a myth that's often presented as almost as silly because at the um, early part of, of um, Achilles life, his mother, who's a goddess mm -hmm. has tried to make him immortal. Like she does not, she did not willingly marry the mm -hmm. mortal hero that she was forced into marrying. And, um, and she, to me is a very problematic figure in, mm -hmm. in Achilles life um, because she, I mean, she really messes with him by, you know, trying to get him as close to immortal as she can. Um, and that that has its consequences for him as a character. So in my first novel, Hand of Fire, he is a uh, he has a very kind of fractured uh, personality in some ways that that he finds a kind of partial or at least temporary healing through his friendships. Uh, one with uh, Briseis and also with his friend Patroclus, who is the, uh, you know, the the his greatest friend in in his narrative. Um, but this story is when his mother was attempting to stop him from ever going to the Trojan War because she, as a goddess, knows the future and knows that that is where he will die. So she's she catch this, dresses him up like a girl and hides him on this little Greek island with a king uh, in sort of basically the women's quarters. That's sort of like, it's oh, not right. a hair in that right. Middle Eastern way, but it's, you know, like the women, among the women, mm -hmm. um, teenage boy, you know, the, how is this going to work out? Well, <laughs> you can imagine. Um, so there, there's various operas where, you know, they're, that are almost comic in terms of, you know, like, and it's a it's a slightly silly premise uh, that you know you could dress a boy up like a girl and no one would figure it out. That is not quite the take, and I I won't reveal my take on this, but I have a, a and my book, as I say, is is much more about this this young woman who is the princess mm -hmm. of of the of this king. Um, and who she becomes. But a lot of the initial, you know, sort of the thing that gets her out of the, the wounded crisis that she's in when he arrives and pushes her towards uh, oh. her own heroic stature is this 
problematic human being that comes into her world. <laughs> um, and um, and in the similar way that that this problematic human being comes into Briseis's world in mm -hmm. the end of fire. So it's a much it's a serious book as opposed to comic. Um, right. And uh, I actually, because I think that is, is the, his mother, the goddess, is so clueless about humanity and human beings, um, instead of just dressing him up, which is just comic, she, uh, she transforms his outside so that he has the body of a woman. Mm -hmm. I'm telling, which is not the way the myth goes, but to me, it's a, it's an emotionally much more compelling mm -hmm. problem because mm -hmm. that is not who he is, right? And you know that is just really messing with a with him. Oh, so yeah, is, right, yeah, um, and that that cha you know that's not a permanent state for him. Like we all know how that myth goes. He's you know he's the the great warrior um, later in the war. So you know people who read mythic retellings kind of know the outline of the myth at least. Um, you know mm -hmm. typically. Um, so it's not a spoiler that he doesn't stay that way forever. But that's kind of the starting trigger point of the. Of, of this book but I'm in really early stages of writing it it's lots of fun I'm really loving it um I am will be very glad I right now I've been spending a lot of time on the marketing of flights of treason as the fourth book of the series now the whole series is complete and you mm -hmm. know it has to go out in the world and find lots of readers and I hope that it will because it's it's really fun and um and but I will be glad when I can ratchet back a little bit on the on the marketing side of life mm -hmm. and back immerse myself in the writing side yes um, yeah yeah the marketing stuff takes so long and I'm not very good at it so um can then I don't, I'm not sure that most people are I mean you know even people who are good at it, it it's often that they have had a series of lucky you know like mm -hmm. things came together in a really good way. And once in a while they do for me and I'm like, yes, I got some traction, but you know, for the most part, it's just hard work. Yes. Um, it's that's reader right. by reader. Yeah. Right. No one, yes. and, and not, not very many people go onto Amazon and say, I'm going to look for a historical fantasy based in the Hittites. You know, <laughs> they, they, we are breaking in the, the world of fantasy is gradually, um, you know, we all love Tolkien and the medieval mm -hmm you know, model of fantasy. Mm -hmm. That's the iconic start of the whole, you know, it's not the start of the fantasy tradition, but you know, that's like a mm -hmm. major mm -hmm. and yay, we all love that. But fortunately it's more now. Fantasy has, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're set within, you know, the East and the Middle East and mm -hmm. as mine's Middle Eastern. And then there, you know, all mm -hmm. kinds of different ways of setting fantasy that's, within the historic framework of mm -hmm. this planet, but it's sort of, I mean, I, I consciously put mine in a, in a non-real environment so that people don't think, well, you, you messed with the history. And it's like, well, I didn't mess with the world building, the historical setting and the major events right. are all true. But do you know how many gaps there are in what actually happened? Oh. And who these people are, there are more gaps than there is information. So I have, would have been making it up. It would have been fantasy in that sense of made up, right. no matter what I did, no matter how accurate I was trying to be. And it's way more fun to honor what these people thought and then let it, I mean, the fantasy, the, mm -hmm. the series starts with a reluctant hero. She is not really eager to do a lot of magic. And over the sequence of four books, mm -hmm. that's part of her arc. Her part of her arc is growing into a, mm -hmm. you know, a powerful woman. And part of it is growing her into a powerful sorcerer. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, and that is not, uh, mm -hmm. yes, it's a little, little taking the fantasy off in a, um, in a fantastical direction that is <laughs> no no one when you read the history book about queen pudu hepa no one says and she was an active sorcerer okay i get it <laughs> so, 
I just changed the names and, you know, right. I, you know, have colored stars in the sky and uh, yes. realm of griffins that, you know, is part has interaction with human beings. Um, so everyone knows, I know this is fantasy and right. You know, but you will, you will learn, you will be immersed without any effort whatsoever in a historical time of human history also at the same yes. time. Right. I love that. I love that mashup. I call them mashups. Yeah, it like, is a mashup. Yeah. Yeah. Like Naomi Novik's uh, dragons in uh, yes. the Napoleonic Wars. Right. Exactly. <laughs> You know, and it's just fun or, you know, or George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones, you know, mm -hmm. he's a historical, you know, nobody was thinking about Vikings as a really popular thing or, or, you know, War of the Roses period or anything mm -hmm. until he made it super fun with a whole lot of dragons and slaughter. And, you know, right. Right. Yeah. I don't, I, I, mine is way less violent than that. And, um, I, way more positive about women than that but yeah um, you're right that's yeah the interesting you know usurping thrones and right driving for power and all of that is such an uh primeval part of human history it is it is really oh this has been so much fun i have enjoyed this conversation so much do you have anything else any last thoughts uh, no, I guess I could say if, if you have, if people have enjoyed this conversation, um, as I have, um, and they're interested in a little bit more, um, they can go to my website, which is just my name, judithstarkston.com and sign up for my newsletter. I have an author newsletter. And when you sign up for that, you'll get a whole Griffin novella, no human beings in it, just Griffins. It's very fun. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, as you've noticed, my Griffins have a sort of telepathic communication mm -hmm. style, so you get mm -hmm. the full uh, array of emotions, even though they are definitely not human beings. Um, so they can be characters in a novel. Um, and But I also have on my website, when you sign up for the author newsletter, if you really are interested in this history and historical fiction set in historical worlds and all that, you can also sign up for my weekly blog. And then I each week, oh. it'll either be a review of a, of a book or some little snippet of an archaeological find in this world and what mm -hmm. it means. And I do kind of a read of it. You know, it's really approachable and popular. And then there's if you're interested in more, there's always a link to, you know, who's really, you know, dug this out and what they have to say. Um, so those are my two sources of information. Um, that are right there on my website, cool. right on the right hand side of every page. Um, so there's that. And then, as I say, Flights of Treason is out May 7th. Um, the whole series is up on Amazon. If you're a KU subscriber, you can just read it right there for free because mm -hmm. I have, I don't have Flights of Treason yet because um, once I enroll it in KU, I can't hand it out to reviewers or anything mm -hmm. for free. Mm -hmm. And I'm still building that, but it will be by the time you get to that one. Uh, most people would would find it there. Uh, yeah. I, it will take me a few weeks, but it'll get there. Cool. That's great. That's yeah. great. Now, of course, I will have um, show notes. So your website will be there. And I am going to put this up on Patreon, too, because your episode doesn't even air until November 20th. Okay. So I'm going to put it on Patreon so that you have some extra exposure. Okay. To your books. Great. Yeah. And I think I have even written about the, your books on my blog, but I will um, do that too. write about them. Okay. How fun they are because occasionally I do a write about a movie that I watched or, or uh, books that I've read that have done, have, you know, made me go, aha, Lilith was one of those that I wrote about. So yeah, I'll write about your, your, um, your books because I think they're fantastic. Well, thank you. So thank you so much for talking well, to me. You. It was fun. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you like what you heard, 
please share it with a friend and give us a rating and or review on your favorite podcast app. It will help people find us. I invite you to join my Patreon community at patreon.com slash story power, all one word. Or if you like, you can subscribe to Story Power on Apple Podcasts. It's my aim to build a community where we discuss the stories we love and talk about what we learned from them. I offer extra audio content and story suggestions to my patrons on both platforms. Remember, as Philip Pullman said, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. Let's spread the story love. Until next time, this is Lucinda Sage Midgordon. Thanks for listening.